starts right now. They're an elite military group that you've probably never even heard of, but now they need your help. Only weeks into the brand new school year and one local school says it is closing its doors. Why and what happens to its students? It's really an issue of public safety. In the past two weeks, five San Antonio police officers have been shot. Another officer accidentally shot himself while chasing an armed suspect. And for the first time since that violence broke out, top county leaders are standing before cameras tonight. They're addressing that recent increase in violence by suspects who law enforcement say should be in jail. Bear County Judge Peter Sakai says he's putting a city county commission together to come up with a solution. Here's a question though. What about the district attorney's office? The night team's Patty Santos breaks down exactly how much money you, the taxpayer, give the DA's office to put criminals behind bars. I want y'all to understand this is a tough job and I've got a tough job to do and I'm gonna do it. I'm willing to come to the table and, and, uh, and help come up with a solution. Bear County Judge Peter Sakai and District Attorney Joe Gonzalez says they don't know what it's gonna to take to keep violent criminals in jail. It is the legislature that is the appropriate forum for a discussion on changing the bail bond system. But taxpayers are set to give the DA's office more than $52 million in the county's fiscal year 2024 budget to keep the community safe. It would add 11 positions to the more than 500 staff. About 200 of those positions are criminal prosecutors. According to a case head investigates report, the DA's office has faced a large number of staff resignations over the past year. Not just Gonzalez told county commissioners in this April meeting that workers were leaving because of low pay. Our prosecutors are overworked, they are overstressed, and they are underpaid. The county dish now pay increases at that time. As of today, Gonzalez says his office is down 20 prosecutors. Judge Shakai wonders if recent policy changes made to reduce the jail population are to blame for violent crimes against police. We've gone to some shifts of policy and perhaps has affected this issue today. As of September 1st, Gonzalez did away with the declination policy, which turned away minor drug possession cases. The policy was in effect for four years. A new state law forces DAs to prosecute those cases. And last year, the district attorney's office received funding to hire 16 new staff to deal with a COVID backlog. Now, commissioners are set to vote on the 2024 budget next week. Soon after that, they say city and county leaders will meet up to come up with some sort of policy change to deal with this crime problem. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. On Monday, Police Chief William McManus and Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez will be at a District 4 Public Safety Town Hall. That town hall is scheduled to start at 6 at St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church. It's on Marbach Road. We plan to live stream it on all of our KSAT streaming platforms. The next step in the 1604 expansion project happening right now. You're looking live at 1604 and Northwest Military. That highway is scheduled to be closed for bridge work until 5 a.m. So this is specifically between the Northwest Military entrance and the exit ramps in both directions. There are several other closures around the city this weekend, and we have a full list with detour information on our website. You know where to go, ksat.com. Yeah, and speaking of construction, if you've driven down Broadway just north of downtown lately, you may have noticed the mess. Don't know how you could have missed it. Two sections of Broadway are closed off for the rest of the year because of ongoing construction. And small business owners, they're starting to feel it. I, as a business owner, am really looking at um, having anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of my business completely taken away because I don't have foot traffic. So I have to um, try to secure funding. I have to try to secure credit line of credit. Um, anything that I can do to kind of uh, put my business on pause potentially um, during that time. I wish uh, the city would take more care, better care of us. Since we cannot pick up the business as, as we're supposed to, we can't employ people. Those business owners hope once the construction projects are done, customer traffic will pick back up. Those are their businesses on the other side of that rubble. As for now, they want everyone to know they are open for business. You can read more about the Broadway Bond Project on our website right now. Look for this article on KSAT.com. Just two, just weeks into the new school year, one San Antonio school says that it's closing its doors.
students and staff at Jubilee Academy's Highland Park campus are going to move to other schools this month. The night team's John Pabarajas explains the charter school district's decision. You know, go to starting school and then shutting it down, giving us two weeks. That's not good. Parents at Jubilee Highland Park say they're frustrated. The little one started class at the East Drexel Avenue campus on August 14th. Come August 31st, Jubilee Academies notified parents that Highland Park would close and students would start at another campus by September 18th. Everybody got disappointed. It was like a last minute thing. It was very emotional. We couldn't believe it. To hear that the school was closing was very heart wrenching. Associate Director of School Development Abel De Leon says they currently have 210 students, but needed 300 to keep the school operational. Let them finish the school year. We asked De Leon about making the changes during the school year. He said, quote, if we didn't rip the Band-Aid off now, there would be more pain later. He adds finishing the school year would have left Jubilee with a deficit of $1.5 million. They could have told us a lot sooner. De Leon tells us parents will be able to transfer their students to Jubilee Highland Hills or Jubilee San Antonio. A charter school district will offer bus transportation with drop-off and pickup at the Highland Park campus through the end of the school year. But parents and students still have concerns. Some of them are saying, well, we're not going to meet each other no more. So they said, well, I'm not going to have my teacher. And said, no, you're going to have a new teacher. A smaller group of kids in each class. The attention from the, from the teachers. De Leon says Jubilee Academies is doing its best to keep all teachers with their current students. Parents we spoke to say they're still skeptical. They didn't ask for input. They didn't ask us how we felt. John Paul Barajas, Kisa, 12 News. We, the jury, find the defendant, Guyan Isaac Perez, not guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. You heard it there. Not guilty. Guyan Perez admitted on a 911 call to shooting his mother's boyfriend in 2022, but he says it was to protect a family member. In August of 2022, Perez was accused of shooting and killing 39-year-old Luis Rosales. Rosales accused of sexually assaulting one of Perez's close relatives. At the end of Perez's trial, he and his family grateful a Bear County jury cleared him of murder. We feel that justice has been served on Guyan. You know, he took the actions he took to defend the ones he loved. All he could tell our cameras afterwards was thank you, thank you, thank you. Prosecutors, though, argued this trial was not about the accusations against Rosales. They say it was about Pettis' actions. You can read more about that trial right now on KSAT.com. This is really history in the making. Ken Paxton's trial continues, just wrapped up its fourth day. Paxton's defense attorney spent this morning portraying the whistleblowers who accused the suspended attorney general of wrongdoing as disgruntled employees. Now on the other side, the former director of law enforcement at the attorney general's office talked about the accusations over Paxton trying to help a political donor. You can read the full breakdown on day four of the trial right now on KSAT.com. A call out to Congress tonight from San Antonio business groups. They want something. They want a direct flight from here to Washington, D.C. through the Ronald Reagan International Airport. Now, members of the Capital Access Alliance San Antonio Coalition spoke today at San Antonio International Airport, and they say the city needs a direct flight to the nation's capital. And they point to our huge military presence and also growing business scene. Thing is, federal restrictions limit those direct flights unless Congress steps in. A local school district superintendent calling it a career, Dr. Clark Ely, announcing his plans to retire after four years of service, the Shirts Ciblo Universal City ISD. His last day with SCUC will be on January 24th. Dr. Ely spent a total of 32 years in education. You know about the Navy SEALs, the Army Rangers, and the Green Beret, but ha Green Berets, excuse me, but how about combat controllers? Yeah, they defend the U.S. in the air, on the ground, in the waters. And a group that wants to help them when they return home has a question for you. Stick around for that. They fought for this country, and now they need your help. But here's a question. Have you actually heard of combat controllers? They are the quiet professionals, the fearless few, who are always the first there to ensure mission success. Combat controllers basically do it all. They're with the U.S. Air Force. They defend the U.S. in the air, on the ground, in the waters. The thing is, though, a lot of people don't know they even exist. 
And that's a problem because when CCTs return home after being deployed, many of them struggle to find their way like a lot of other vets. And that's exactly why Eric Holman, himself a former combat controller, created the First There Foundation. The nonprofit connects CCTs with job and mental health resources and also helps their families. We send out baby blankets when guys have new babies, uh, Gold Star families. We check on them. Um, we paid for our Gold Star families. Uh, you know, garbage disposal. There's not a lot of us. I mean, 350 of us per year, and then you know we're all over the all over the country. So it's we don't have big pockets of it. You know, and relating to other branches, even though we're veterans, it's not the same. Now tomorrow, the First Air Foundation is hosting uh, a fundraising gala. I myself am going to be emceeing the event. I'm super honored to be a part of that. Now, if you'd like to donate to the First There Foundation, we have a link for you on our website, ksat.com. And you can also watch the raw interview with Eric Homan. You'll learn lots of cool stuff about the combat just, controllers. Just that video. Yes. Amazing stuff. Yes. All right. Let's go outside with live cam right now. And, you know, 93 degrees. I am hopeful, Adam, that at this time <laughs> next week, maybe this will be our high. There's, yeah, there's, that's what's the fore, it's in the forecast right okay, now. That's good. what we're expecting. It's, uh, we just have to have everything follow through properly. But I do think we'll dip below 100 as soon as next week's. And rain chances, more importantly, they're back starting tomorrow. Let's get right to it. Take a look at those chances. I know it's nothing significant. We're not looking at a huge drastic change or big system moving in, but just about daily isolated showers and thunderstorms to pop up starting Saturday afternoon and early evening. Then again, Sunday afternoon and early evening, the typical diurnal convection, the late afternoon, early evening from the peak heating from the sun. Now this is what we're watching. So we've had some showers and thunderstorms in North Texas and East Texas and even Arkansas and Louisiana. A little boundaries dropping in and that's going to linger through this weekend as well. And I expect more showers to develop in parts of North and East Texas. And then some of them may even make it our way as the steering flow could push some of them into parts of the case at 12 viewing area, especially east of town, but even locally. Not only that, other ones could be popping up closer to home as well. Here's our future cast. Most of the day tomorrow is going to be quiet, but by the late afternoon, we're saying after three o'clock, so mid to late afternoon, some thunderstorms should start bubbling up and don't pay very close attention to the exact location on the future cast here. Just the mere fact that it's on board for popping some of these showers and storms and in agreement. And although we really need the rain and we'll take what we can get, keep in mind that where it does fall, there is the chance of a severe thunderstorm or two. That's both Saturday and Sunday afternoons because of the setup that we have. Winds would be the primary threat. I quickly want to touch on Lee now a category three hurricane. It's weakened a little bit, but it's likely to re-strengthen as it heads to the northwest through this weekend and into next week. And then right now it still looks like most of the models are favoring that curve northward still doesn't mean the east coast of the US is completely in the clear, but this is a more favorable uh, path for us as it stands right now. 72 100 degree days so far this year. Today was a record breaker 104. That's a record by three degrees and we weren't the only record breaker. Actually, most of Texas had record high temperatures highlighted in these blue boxes. Just about everybody as hot as 112 in Wichita Falls. Del Rio tied a record of 105 tomorrow. Back to 104 here in town. Same with Carrizo Springs and Canyon Lake. 102 Leon Springs, Von Army 104, and then 101 by Sunday. There's that 30% chance of afternoon showers and storms. Again, don't go canceling any outdoor plans. Just have an extra eye and ear to the sky later on in the day. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that. I'm just looking at that forecast and thinking, oh boy, we're trying to get ready for next week. I am there. excited. Yeah, All right. love that forecast. All right, yeah. Whew. he just came running in like a running back in the <laughs> Jefferson Sam Houston game. Oh, I'll tell you what. So it was our big game, big game coverage. It lived up to the hype, especially in the fourth quarter when the fireworks really happened. We have Jefferson, Sam Houston, and highlights of at least, I think, 15 other games coming up. Welcome out to SAISD Sports Complex and get ready for your big game coverage of the Thomas Jefferson Mustangs and the Sam Houston High School Hurricanes.
Thank you, John Villanueva. It's the big game in our big game coverage tonight. The Sam Houston Hurricanes versus the Thomas Jefferson Mustangs in a district matchup, Mary. Here's a little pregame flavor from the SAISD Sports Complex near the goal line. The Mustangs in the background warming up for the Kings. All right, let's get to those highlights. Now here is Jefferson charging the turf, followed by Sam Houston ahead of this District 14 5A D2 showdown. First quarter, Mustangs ball. The handoff goes to Daniel Ariza for a four-yard touchdown, and Jefferson leads seven to nothing and they were up seven to three at halftime late third quarter now hurricanes with the ball and airing it out amir calhoun throws a perfect pass to jeremiah espatia 10 yards and the canes take the lead 10 to 7 what was beautiful wasn't it fourth quarter jefferson leads 13 to 10 and they're kicking off just after scoring the canes jeremiah espatia fields the ball deep and if we're showing this to you then you know he's about to break off something special number four is coming right at us down the sideline he goes he pulls up and cuts inside to avoid a defender. 98-yard touchdown return, and that turns out to be the game Ooh. winner. Oh, man, what a play. <laughs> Sam Houston takes it 17-13. to 13. I, thought, really, I thought I was close to the sideline, so I tried to toe tap. I didn't really need a toe tap for real, but I caught it. It was really mad. Run when you saw that gap, what, what was going through your mind, man? I see it. It was just straight grass. I just took it. Wide open touchdown. The student section at Linoff Stadium was in the island spirit tonight for the number one Steel Knights hosting the Hutto Hippos. Let's get tropical. First quarter, Knights quarterback Chad Warner with time to throw fires over the top to Royal Capel for a 40 yard touchdown toss and catch, and the Knights go up eight to nothing after a two point conversion. Later in the quarter, Andrew Buck runs it from a yard out. The Knights go up 15 to nothing, and the score from Lynn Hoff is Steel is currently leading 57 27 in the fourth quarter. Let's go to Rutledge Stadium for Pflugerville Weiss and number 11 Judson tonight third quarter tied to seven Rockets ball quarterback Elijah Favela looking around he has nowhere to pass he ends up throwing a backward pass the Wolves the Haley Bradfield picks it up he runs it back for a touchdown and Weiss leads 14 to 7 and your score from Rutledge Weiss leads Judson 14 to 10 in the fourth quarter here's the Clark Cougars taking the field at Comalander Stadium where they played the second ranked Reagan Rattlers in 12's top 12 first quarter Reagan kicker Jonathan Leos draws a 21 yard field goal and the Rattlers lead 3 nothing late second quarter now the Cougars answer back Philip Metzger dancing in the pocket throws to wide open Ethan Maldonado 25 yard touchdown and the Clark Cougars lead the Reagan Rattlers 7-3 at halftime. And the score from Comalander, Reagan comes back to win 38-14. All right, through two weeks, Alamo Heights has put up 132 points over its opponents. Let's see how Highlands handles the fury that is the Mules. First quarter, Mules senior QB Colin Ertz pass over the middle. Trip Johnson makes the grab, rolling over his defender across the goal line for the 33-yard TD. Alamo Heights coasts to a 65-7 win over the Owls. Burbank is undefeated to start the season. Bracken Ridge is winless. Will the trend continue? Bulldogs Kevin Hernandez spins out of a tackle. He finds the seam on the outside, making it look easy on the QB keeper for the 20-yard touchdown. Burbank up. 34 to 0. Roman Garcia in at QB. Now he throws a bullet to Leonard Lozano for a 40 yard score. Burbank remains undefeated with a 56 to 14 victory. Class 4 AD1 runner up Bernie and Antonian clash at Ferreira Field. Third quarter Hudson Hendricks extends the Greyhounds lead by a touchdown. Hendricks is a tank. Very difficult to bring him down. This was a great display of football. In the end, Bernie wins 42 to 35. That's a pretty good ball game and some 6A football. The Sotomayor Wildcats are undefeated and we're looking for another big win tonight hosting the Stevens Falcons. Second quarter Cats defense coming up big. Isaiah Espinoza with a huge interception sets the Wildcats up in great field position which led to a toss play to Jaden Gutierrez who looks for the edge uses his speed and dives for the pylon and the score from Ferris Stadium Sotomayor wins 28 to nothing out at the Gus the O'Connor Panthers were hosting John Jay and the Mustangs defense was ready for this one Diego Quiroz jumps the pass to snag the interception and takes it all the way to the red zone where he gets tripped up now that would set up Jack Mota with a wide open lane for the touchdown. Here it comes. And that score from Jay 
uh, from Gus, excuse me, John J. Rolls, 43-14 at Hero Stadium. MacArthur was hosting Veterans Memorial Patriots. Both teams one-to-one -one coming into this one. The Patriots were having success early with the running attack. Tavion Warren slices and dices up the middle until he's finally brought down at the eight-yard line. Later in the drive, they give it to Warren again, and he stiff arms a defender on his way in for a touchdown, and the score from Heroes is 46-23, Veterans Memorial. Time to shake hands the Pleasanton Eagles at the Jerton Indians tonight first quarter Eagles QB Cade Segura hits number four Aiden Rich on the slant and Rich picks up 68 yards into Jerton territory inside the 10 yard line that would eventually lead to a three yard touchdown run and Pleasanton led seven to nothing later in the first Indians tie up the game Caden Schulte from three yards out this game is tied at seven and the score from Jerton the Indians take it 35 21. Over at Harlandale Memorial Stadium, the Indians hosting the winless Lanier Vokes. First drive for Harlandale. Jose es Joseph Esparza cuts back to the middle and is gone, running straight into the sunset for a 52-yard touchdown. Then after a block punt, Harlandale takes over in the run zone and hands it off to Zion Molina for a stroll up the middle. The Indians go on to win it 44 to nothing. Rattler Stadium, the site for a matchup between Wagner and San Marcos. What a play. The reverse goes to Tony Diaz. The senior turns on the Jets and takes it all the way. It'll be a photo finish. San Marcos up seven. Wagner comes right back with a 69-yard touchdown catch. Edgar Bell Jr. The final from this one, Wagner is up 55-17 in the fourth. Mary, that was one heck of a first block. I'm still catching my <laughs> breath. Still to come, the BGC road trip to Davenport and New Braunfels High School. And before we go, let's take a listen to the Cole High School Cougar Band. Welcome back. It's time for the road trip that took photojournalist Eddie Latigo to New Braunfels for the worst bowl and then to Davenport High School located off 3009. We begin with the Davenport and Piper matchup. Both teams eyeing bounce back games after respective week two losses. <laughs> Let's get to it. Third quarter, Tristan Hamlin connects with Emmett Greeman, who's wide open at the Wolves logo. Greeman bounces off a defender. Nice piece of running for the yeah. senior. Later in the drive, Hamlin on the QB keeper for the TD from 20 yards out. Devin four up 17 to 16. It's a back and forth battle. Piper answers. Jake South tosses a beauty to the corner of the end zone. Jake Strachan makes the diving catch. Worst bowl time, New Braunfels hosting Canyon. Go big or go home. Electric <laughs> pregame with skydivers getting things started. The home team feeling the energy. Tyree Johnson goes untouched to pay dirt. Unicorns on the board first. Canyon matches the energy. Jackson Reagan makes the catch on the outside. The sophomore dodges a sea of blue jerseys. He goes to opposite field. It'll be a 23-yard game. Cougars cash in soon after, punching it in for six. The Cougars and Unicorns left it all out on the field. Let's see how these played out. Piper edges out Davenport 34 to 31, and New Braunfels wow. Canyon goes into the home of New Braunfels, winning 32 to 28. All right, see how many more scores we can get to here. We have Smithson Valley beating East Central 57 to 7, Bernie Champion over Canyon Lake by a final of 42 to 20, and two more. You have Lavernia winning 45 to nothing, Somerset 42 21 over Floresville. A couple more scores. Randolph is a winner tonight, so is Poth over. Shiner and we've also got uh, Natalia losing to Divine Navarro beating Smithville and Bandera over Kennedy 49 to 7. That is it for big game coverage. Mary fantastic job tonight. Oh yeah. And Fist I think uh, we're sending it to the break if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right we'll be right back after the break. <laughs> <laughs> By the way I want to add Judson lost tonight. They have not been 0-3 in a long time. Yikes. Have a good night.